Hey everyone, Paul here. Um, welcome to the latest live read, uh, live stream of our, our Teams book for managers adopt and embrace Microsoft Teams, a manager's guide to communication, collaboration, and coordination with Microsoft Teams. We're getting a fair way through the book, uh, through these live reads, which is great. So we'll spend another uh, probably 30 to 40 minutes today going through two more chapters of the book. Uh, the two chapters we're gonna focus on today, are the people chapter and the priorities chapter. And they will help us answer the questions that we get with pretty much every customer that we work with uh, when it comes to uh, you, know, uh, you know starting out their journey with Microsoft Teams. And that is like, who should I invite into the team? Who should be a member of our team? And how many people is too many people? Or you know, is it a time we should split into a couple of teams because we've got too many people? And also the question around channels. So what is the right number of channels for us to have? Um, are we diluting our focus by having too many channels? If we Are we kind of overwhelming people with having too few channels but lots of conversation? So really the chapters that we'll focus on today, we're gonna to focus on um, basically solving those problems for you, which is um, pretty exciting because it's a common thing that comes up all the time. If you couple that with what we talked about last week in terms of problem and purpose, uh, the first four of the 10 P's together help you design the perfect team structure um, for whatever collaboration or coordination challenge you have in your team or in your organization, which is uh, which is pretty cool. So what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna grab the copy of the book off the bookshelf behind me so we can have a read through it again. So if you haven't got a copy of it, just do the plug at the start, uh, head on over to teamsbook.info and all the links to all the, uh, all the places you can buy the book there. But if you go to Amazon or other places, you can get that. Um, hopefully the audio quality and the video quality are okay today coming to you from our co-working space in the heart of Brisbane City. Uh, first time I've been in here for a while, um, not the garage today, so should be no barking dogs in the background, hopefully. Um, but we'll see what happens, eh? Uh, hopefully no, we do have dogs in the office sometimes, so we'll see what happens. Um, so what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna go to, go through the pages here, find the right spot, gone too far. People chapter, here we go. So for those reading it along at home, up to page 89 of the book, and we'll start with the people chapter. Again, if you've got any questions, if you wanna chime into the chat, please feel free to chime in on the chat. I'll keep an eye on it as we go and see if I can answer any questions as we go through it too. All right, so let's get into it. People. Great things in business are never done by one person. They're done by a team of people, Steve Jobs. Teamwork makes the dream work. There is no I in team. Team stands for together everyone achieves more. There are dozens of more corny lines that managers have used over time to inspire their people to come together and achieve more. Having the best one liner will not set you up for success, but having the right people on your team will. That is true in your real life team, just as much as it is for the team you're setting up in Microsoft Teams. While we've all been members of a fair share of bad teams over the years, the nightmares of some group projects in high school still haunt me today, the experience of being a member of a well-oiled team, oh, sorry, a well-oiled, highly functioning team is incredible. In our experience, the best teams are those made up of people who come from a variety of perspectives, backgrounds, cultures, and values, with a clear purpose and a commitment to giving everyone a voice in the conversation. Establishing a successful team takes deliberate effort, and most managers don't get the opportunity to form or reform teams all that regularly, maybe once every three years when there's a restructure or when you get a chance to establish a new business unit, or when you get that big promotion to department head. While embracing technology like Microsoft Teams will not ensure your success, it will give you the opportunity to practice your craft in forming successful teams far more often and provide you with the tools to make teamwork more seamless. Every time you seek to solve a business problem or bring people together for a shared purpose, you have the opportunity to establish effective teamwork with a new group of people and technology that can help you amplify their impact. In an organization, there are different rules of thumb as to how many people should be in a team. You may think that throwing more people at a problem would make life easier. Some suggest that larger teams reduce the likelihood of micromanagement. Robin Dunbar, a British anthropologist, researched primate brain size and average social group size. Using the average size of a human brain as a yardstick, he suggested that a human can maintain 150 stable relationships with others. On the other hand, some people simply like to work in small groups or even have their own, or sorry, even on their own. Researchers from Wharton, Harvard, and other respected institutions suggest that the sweet spot, depending on the focus of the team, is between four and nine members. My favorite is the two pizza rule that Jeff Bezos implemented at Amazon. If a team cannot be fed with two pizzas, then it is too big. 
or your amatite is a bit too much as well. Probably in my case, a bit too much. Um, one important concept to consider uh, from the field of applied psychology is the Ringelmann effect. Named after French agricultural engineer, uh, Maximilian Ringelmann, the Ringelmann effect describes how individual motivation decreases as team size increases. The classic example provided is a tug of war. Conventional wisdom would say that the more people that pull on the end of the rope, the more effort is applied. Interestingly, as the effect describes, as more people join your team to pull on the rope, the average effort of each participant significantly decreases. As individual output is less identifiable, people tend to rely more on their team members to get the job done versus putting in the effort themselves. The more people in your team, the more inefficient the team. And that was research from back in 1913 as well. So it's, um, but I think it probably holds true if you reflect on a lot of the teams that you might be a member of. When you've got lots of people, it's easy for people to hide in the team or hide their, hide their contribution or their contribution might not be as visible because it's drowned out or diluted by others as well. Uh, which begs the question, why can you create a team in Microsoft Teams that has up to 5,000 members in it? And I'm pretty sure that number is a lot higher than 5,000 from when we originally published the book. Um, a long time ago, uh, over 12 months ago now. So again, one of the things with uh, Microsoft and their limits, they keep changing and they tend to keep going um, higher and higher. Um, so we can, we can have thousands, tens of thousands of people in a team. So why? what is the point of having that many people in a team in Microsoft Teams if the research and the evidence suggests that fewer people in a team actually gets you a better productivity outcome or a better you know, business outcome that you're looking towards? Um, so should we be creating teams where we can have dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of participants just because we have technology that can help us connect that number of people together? Or should we take a more practical approach? In this chapter, we will explore some considerations of who should be a member of a team, how many members you should have, and what roles and responsibilities lie within the team. At first glance, it might seem obvious who should be part of your team, but questioning how you could set up your team gives rise to alternative approaches, all of which have merit. If you need convincing that different approaches exist, count how many of the patterns outlined later in this book have some relevance to your team. Getting the right people on your team. A team requires team members. There's no two ways about it. But let's face it, you are realizing that people are over sorry, you're realizing that people are overwhelmed at work and possibly frustrated with technology. Telling them, hey, I'll add you as a team member to my team without setting up some context for them is likely to result in little to no support or engagement from them. And we've seen this quite often during the pandemic as well as people have gone and created um, spaces for work at home, remote work, all that kind of stuff to keep their teams connected. Um, other, other teams have started to emerge and we haven't really given people the heads up of why they need to be in the team, what, what relevance it has to the role, that kind of thing. So it's, it's interesting, the, you know, how do we make sure people um, are aware of the reasons why to be there in the first place? You know, the problem and the purpose we talked about earlier uh, in, the, in the last live stream um, to make sure they actually you know, you don't want to participate in that space as well. Uh, so to be successful, you need to spend some time thinking about the right people for your team. That is, they must be empowered and engaged and have a common ground in solving a work problem to help you achieve your shared purpose. This may came, come from the same department, oh, sorry, they may come from the same department or across business units. They may be inside or outside your company, or they could be in similar or different roles. Regardless, the people you select will make or break your project, so it's worth investing time into this consideration. So where do you start? First things first, don't fall into the trap of volunteering people to become involved in your team because of the misconception that it'll save you time if you force people to get involved. Uh, all you are doing is disrespecting their time and expertise. You're going to struggle to find common ground right from the beginning of the team's formation because they had no choice in getting involved. And this is actually a really important thing to think about with uh, like all company teams um, or, or you know, we have the, the teams that span across an entire organization, if whether it's a, a voluntary joining one or one that's mandated as an all company team. Um, you know, taking that choice away from people, like it's empowered and probably less likely to want to engage in that particular space as well, unless there's something else overcoming that, I guess, roadblock or challenge that they see there from um, being voluntold to participate in the space. So it's something to consider with your large teams or your organization teams that you might be thinking about establishing. Uh, similarly, you don't always have to make it the choice about who needs to be part of your team. You may be pleasantly surprised to hear who others believe may have more vested interests in the team outcomes. Conducting a short half-hour meeting to decide who needs to be a part of the team 
will provide you with a starting point for determining the right people for your team and will also give you the confidence and authority you need to introduce your project and seek their support and contribution. This will make your job easier because you're asking for them to support and contribute to something that will mean a gain for them, a classic what's in it for me. That is, their participation will also help solve a problem for them. So what if you can't find the right people? Like in, our, in our experience, when you find uh, the right people, I should just make sure I didn't mute myself, oh, that's good. Um, in our experience, when you find the right people for your team, there's usually something else at play. Oh, sorry, when you can't find the right people for your team, there's usually something else at play. It's not that you can't find the right people, but it may be that you have not adequately, adequately diagnosed the problem and therefore may not have defined a clear purpose. Use the earlier chapters in the book to outline the problem you need to solve. Reflect on the people who may, be, who may be most affected or impacted by this problem and then ask them about it. For example, imagine you had to build a team to solve a problem. The problem centers on merging the details of additional staff members into your HR, a human resources information system, HRIS, uh, because your company recently merged with another company. In this case, you may need to consider team members who come from your HR team and IT team, um, but also the other company's HR and IT teams. You may need to also consider inviting the HR technology vendor to be involved, especially if the team identifies a need to customize system requirements or they want to reduce risk and have the vendor involved as well. You may also need to invite the senior HR and technology managers of both companies to participate as they are stakeholders too. So, so you can see how widely you must consider the matter of who should be in your team. Ultimately, there must be people who have a common ground and a vested interest in the project. Um, and this vested interest in the project is a really interesting um, kind of, uh, I guess, uh, a test, I guess, to see if someone should be involved in a team or not. Um, we've seen examples where um, people will add people, um, so team owners will add uh, a wide variety of people to a team just as an FYI. Um, so that just so people are aware of the information that's going on. And sometimes that can be okay. But the challenge you have with that is, again, you're, you're overwhelming people with noise that may not actually be run to their role or what they're focusing on at the time and things like that. So if you're thinking about a litmus test of who should be involved in your team, making sure people that have a vested interest in the outcome and the shared outcome that will contribute to the outcome is a, is a really important thing to consider as well. Uh, so when selecting the team members of your team, don't just default to your organization structure or the people immediately around you. Your organization is a microcosm of diverse perspectives and experiences that generally, remain, generally remains untapped. Others working in different teams, business units, or organizations outside of your company should not be forgotten. So you have the right people in the room. What's next? Uh, congratulations, you've made it this far. You have a group of people with genuine interest in and motivation to be part of your team, and they're ready to contribute their ideas, begin conversations, collaborate on solutions, and create something that will help support the business in some way. The next thing we need to consider is, should we break this team up? Uh, what now? You want me to break up this team of 43 people we have handpicked from across our organization and our external partners? Yes, uh, yes we do. Even though it is tempting to create a team for your project or initiative and throw everyone into that one group, there is some complexity and nuance that you need to consider if you want to set yourself up for success with Microsoft Teams. Ultimately, it boils down to one thing, information security. As a member of a team in Microsoft Teams, you have the same level of access to conversations and files as everyone else in your team. This is a great start, but as but as, well, excuse me, this is a great start and far better than the siloed nature of individual mailboxes across your organization. However, the information or security needs of team members can vary, and in almost every case, they do vary. For example, imagine you manage a team of 20 people and have three team leaders as direct reports. The conversations that you want to have with your team leaders will be different from those who may share with, um, sorry, my words are not coming out properly today. Let me try that sentence again. The conversations you want to have with your team leaders will be different from those you may share with the entire group. How do you configure your team so you can have a more private conversation with your leadership team? So when Microsoft Teams was first released, the two options we had were, or you had were, to set up a simple group chat between yourself and your team leaders. And again, we can do that just through the, the group chat button that's on the um, left-hand side of the um, of the tab on the rail there, where you can set up a mul multiple people into a group chat and chat with them that way. Um, or you can create a separate team just for you and your team leaders. 
The former is okay for simple communication, but lacks the ability to create channels to focus the conversation. The latter means being a member of two teams. Today, based on popular demand via Microsoft's user voice account, we can suggest or support improvements to Microsoft products, including Microsoft Teams. Microsoft has added the ability to create a private channel. Private channels are the perfect for the scenario we have painted above. You have a team of people, but there is one subset of the group where you want to have a more secure conversation that can't be seen by others, where you create a team that includes external participants, and you want to have a channel where you, can, where you and your colleagues can discuss topics without those external guests seeing the conversation taking place. While private channels make a lot of sense in these examples, excuse me, it may be better to create a separate team or teams instead, as the information or communications needs change across your group. The beauty of a clearly named team is that you can quickly build a mental model in your mind of who is a member of that team and therefore what they can see. By adding one private channel, you can maintain that mental model. For example, the team I manage can see most things, but the team of my team of team leaders can see all things. If you add a second, third, or fourth private channel to address the needs of different subgroups, then that mental model gets complex very quickly. And the result is you or one of your colleagues may end up sharing the wrong information into the wrong channel and accidentally disclosing something you didn't intend to. And we've seen a few examples of this happening during COVID, even before COVID, of organizations that haven't understood what that mental model in their mind, or so individuals in organizations that haven't understood that mental model of who has access to what within a team. We've seen spreadsheets of contact information. We've seen you know, spreadsheets of people that they were planning to make redundant, which is really hor horrible information to discover um, at any time, but discovering it on a spreadsheet that magically appears that was being shared into the wrong channel. It's probably one of the worst ways to find out about that kind of information. So there's lots of lots of examples where this information security thing and the design of the team you know, has, it has a bit of an impact on the outcomes and the risk profile of your organization and things like that. So at the time of publishing this book, private channels also lack the ability to schedule meetings or add a private plan of plan, which may impact the value of your specific use cases. And that's still the fact today in terms of being, not being able to schedule meetings and private channels and other things that you have limits to in the private channel as well. So our rule of thumb is that you have so if so our rule of thumb is that if you have one larger group of people and one subgroup that has different security or access needs, use a private channel. If you have two or more subgroups, it is best to split them up into separate teams. Based on the people you need to include in your initiative and the different information needs, you may now have one, two, or more teams. Don't be afraid of having more teams. As you will discover over time, this will give you more fine-grained control over how you engage in the, these collaboration and coordination spaces. You can control notifications more easily and identify when someone needs your help more quickly. Microsoft Teams basically starts automatically filtering work into nice discrete buckets without you needing to do the filtering yourself. And look, an interesting example of that recently, we're working with a customer uh, and helping them define how they structure teams for projects, like uh, you know, a complex, more complex projects than, than simple ones. And there's lots of different subgroups of people within a project. So you've got the, the project control group, like maybe it's the, the project manager and a few key project members and maybe the project manager from a vendor in that group. You might have a steering committee, which is representatives of the business that kind of give guidance and approvals for the project as well. And you've got the people that just do work on the project as well. So in a, in a case of a complex project, you might have three, potentially more subgroups of people that have clearly different information needs. Now, we had all of them in one team called, you know, Project X, and we had a channel for each of those different things. Um, you know, if they're just public channels, like the default ones, you'd see, I you guess, know, cross-pollination of information and, and information that potentially shouldn't be shared between those different audiences starting to appear. Um, you could absolutely have some private channels, um, and maybe you just have a private channel for that project control group that's within the flow of the work of everyone else doing the work on the project in the team um, that allows them to share information in that particular space um, and collaborate quite nicely. Um, but that steering committee is an interesting one where it made more sense to have that steering committee and the engagement with the steering committee occur in a separate team completely. And that allowed the project manager to manage and kind of keep a separation between those two things, um, communicate information when they needed to to that steering committee without having them have access to all the get the minutiae of what's going on in the project as well and focus their attention on stuff that they need some decisions about. Um, so thinking about these different subgroups of people in the use case or scenario that you're thinking about can make a big impact on how you structure the teams that will support that initiative or use case as well.
Right. So assigning roles and responsibilities. There are different roles in a team. Assigning roles and responsibilities is relatively easy in teams because there are effectively only two roles that can be assigned to people, a team owner or a team member. Someone designated as a member cannot edit any team details, add new members, or delete a team. They can do everything else, such as add channels, tabs, connectors, and even bots, assuming your organization allows you to have some of those things turned on. You can apply some fine-grained control over what your team members and team owners can do through the settings for your team. Of course, there are slight changes to the activities that these roles can do, depending on whether your team is public or private. However, in effect, being a team member doesn't hinder someone's participation in an ability to work within a team. If a member needs traditional responsi sorry, additional responsibilities, they can always ask, a, ask the team owners or IT administrator to upgrade their role. Therefore, one consideration you'll need to make is to decide who in your team needs to be a team owner and who needs to be a member. We recommend that you approach this from a task point of view. Ask yourself, what are the likely tasks this person will need to undertake in the team? What level of access do they need to uh, information or resources, resources such as files, folders, and documents? Are they going to play an active role in the decision-making or leadership of the team that will require them to have access to more functionality within the team or administer functions on behalf of others in their team? Are they aware of their roles and responsibilities towards the team and or its administration? And will they require some levels of control or moderation of information sharing? By considering the role that everyone plays in the team through a task view, you're better able to assign the appropriate role to each member. One thing we encourage you to do is to make sure that you have a few owners for your team as a backup. That way, if the owner leaves the organization or your team, there are others who can take their place to ensure all functions can still be undertaken. And don't worry, IT can always step in if the owners, um, all the owners leave a team as well. Of course, don't spring this role on unsuspecting team members. It's a good idea to get their commitment to be team owners before you assign them to the role and explain what additional functionality they have access to. They need to know this because they may be asked by others to undertake additional activities such as answer requests to add more members to the team or be involved in how the team is set up or archived once completed. They may also need some coaching or a demonstration of how they can do this for themselves. Oh, just bear with me, so I'll just have a uh, drink of water. Oh. cold water tastes so good. Um, all right, what about moderating conversations? We often get asked about what happens when conversations go awry in the team channels or how you can moderate these. In practice, it doesn't happen all that often. However, there are some specific use cases where you might want to, um, may not want anyone to reply to a post or when you just want to make announcements to a team without the noise of responses. There's no best practice on setting up how conversations will happen. It's only your team's way. In the chapter on principles, uh, which we'll talk about soon, we will guide you on what you can do to guide your team members to engage within your team. We got guide one too many times in the sentence, I think. Um, but this is, issue is not just about conversations. It also, it's also about how the team has been set up. Every team is different. And depending on the various decisions around the 10 Ps, you're going to find that there's a multitude of ways to use Microsoft Teams for the purpose you want to achieve. For example, we worked with one airline that identified their flight and cabin staff were so overwhelmed with email communication that they were unable to keep up with company and flight announcements. As a result, the company decided to create a Microsoft team uh, and broadcast only priority communications through a few channels. This way, the expectation of flight staff was that if they didn't have time to read the email, their main way of acquiring knowledge was through Teams. They didn't interact with or engage in the channels as they were simply a means to stay on top of important information. This reduced the various channels of communication in the company from intranet, email, and social networks to a handful of Teams channels that grouped key alerts together. This example demonstrates an alternative way of using Microsoft Teams using channel moderation. Moderation provides a level of control over what is being shared and is usually provided to certain team members. Team owners have this function by default, however, members have it turned off. Channel moderators can start new posts, add and remove members, and control whether members, bots, and connectors can submit and reply to messages. Moderation does have a place in teamwork because we must consider the overall purpose and intent of the team itself. In the above example, the intention was to provide up-to-date company information that wouldn't overwhelm flight and cabin staff at the time when they needed it the most. 
it saved them time and they no longer had to search across multiple platforms and it didn't add any additional anxiety or stress before their flights. So with this example in mind, consider what kind of information your people need and structure your team to suit. In this chapter, we explored some of the ways to search for the right people to be involved in your team and looked at assigning their key roles and responsibilities. Let's face it, teamwork is not about the technology. It's about people helping people to achieve a common goal. Making sure you spend the time choosing the right people to solve pesky business problems will ensure your team's implementation is a success. I've got a couple of, at the end of each chapter, obviously got a couple of key takeaways we'll talk about. So the key takeaways for the people chapter, consider who you want to be part of your team. Ensure that all team members have a common ground and interest in solving the problem at hand. And the reason why we say that is because if they don't have a common purpose, if there's no real interest in being a part of the team, the chance they is going to overwhelm them with noise and distraction that they don't need. And it may actually also impact your reputation in work as well by being the person who invites everyone to every team and overwhelms people with that information as well. Um, takeaway number two, in most cases, the smaller the team, the better. Don't be afraid to break a large team into a smaller one, as not all the conversations or topics in a large team will be relevant to all members. And don't just try and default to having one team for an entire department or one team for an entire organization. There is beauty in having those smaller, more focused teams because it helps you, you know, have people focused together, focused on the right stuff, focused on getting that shared outcome. And, it, and you can kind of reduce the distraction, reduce the noise that's in there as well. So you can actually be focused on your work. The smaller, the better, generally. Uh, consider the roles and responsibilities of your team members. Clarify the tasks they would need to undertake and assign these accordingly. Don't forget to seek their approval prior to the assignment and coach them in or demonstrate any tasks they would need to undertake as part of their role. And then fourth, consider whether your team members need an additional level of responsibility for the control of information within the channels to provide moderator functions. So particularly if you're in a, uh, you know, a school or a university or something like that, you might have a, a team owner who might be the, the lead uh, who's facilitating the course or an instructional designer that might be um, pulling the course together. Um, but you might have tutors or other staff that are part of the team delivering the, the, the course or the object that you're delivering that may actually want to have that moderation capability so they can post stuff and control whether things were replied to or not as well. So it's interesting just thinking about the tasks that people need to do in the team and then applying the appropriate controls to that particular person. All right, so the end of chapter, ch chapter, oh my goodness. Let's start this again. End of chapter checklist. Think about the information needs of your team. If there's more than one subgroup with different needs, split into th uh, more specific teams. Fill in step three of your 10 P's workbook. If you don't have a copy of your 10 P's workbook, head over to teamsbook.info click on the resources button and you'll find a link to the 10 P's workbook there. And again, you can use that in your organization. You can pick it up and apply it and have your team owners use the workbook to design their team. So feel free to use that. The license, um, Creative Commons license is there in the document for you to have a look at um, when you get a chance. Uh, and uh, finally, if you're planning on having external guests in your team, go back to step two in the workbook, which we talked about uh, last, last time, and add EXT to the start of your team name. Just make sure everyone knows you have guests. And this one's really important. If you've got external guests in your team, uh, participating in your team, you want to make sure that it's clearly visible that there's external guests so people can make sure they're sharing appropriate knowledge to that, which is why if you have external members in the team, we just recommend you add that preface EXT in brackets at the start of your team name to make sure that people are really clearly aware of it. Now, there is a little thing in the top right-hand corner of Teams that will have a really tiny font that says, you know, you've got guests in the team, but most people don't spot that. So that's the reason why we say put it into the name. Um, so if you bear with me one moment, um, we've got the priorities chapter coming up. Let me just check. Yeah, it's a reasonably short one. I'm just going to grab a drink again. Sorry. Way too much talking today. Um, and again, if, you, if you're people watching live, if you've got any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, people that are watching the recording, head into the comments and ask any questions there. We'll see if we can reply to them um, as well um, later on uh, in the week or after you've watched the video as well. Um, so next chapter, it's the fourth P, priorities. Again, this one's really focused on that other question. We just answered who should be in a team and how many people should be in a team. This one's about answering what are the right channels we should have in the team. How many channels is too many? What should be my priority channels that I put in there? That kind of thing. So let's get into the, the priorities chapter. A question we regularly ask in our workshops is how many priorities, sorry, how many priorities can you focus on at any one time? It's an interesting exercise as hearing the answers can offer a good overview of how aligned a team is. Uh, I guess 10 or 12, 
it's usually followed by very quickly by someone else in the team who says excitedly, no, we can only focus on one thing at a time. The conversation generally devolves from there for the next few minutes as the group tries to determine their shared priorities. No matter the size or shape of your team, a group of sorry, a group collaborating or coordinating together to achieve a shared goal will likely have several priorities. One thing we know for sure is that no one is effective when they are overwhelmed by their priorities. If you have 10, 50, 100 or more priorities, then the chances are that you will dilute your attention so much that you will not get any everything done. In fact, research conducted by PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC, and published in the Harvard Business Review in 2011 suggested that there is a correlation between the number of priorities an organization has and their reported revenue growth. The fewer the priorities an organization had, the greater percentage of respondents that reported above average industry, above industry average revenue growth. Uh, those organizations that, that had not prioritized at all were the worst growth performers. So basically, we just want to make sure we've got enough priorities that we can actually focus on and achieve and not overwhelm ourselves with priorities. Too many priorities, we're not going to get any focus on the stuff that needs to happen, and we might you know, miss out on the, uh, the outcomes we're trying to achieve. So when it comes to the priorities of your team, we believe that the sweet spot is somewhere between three and seven things. If you have fewer than three priorities, you may not be structuring your work in the most effective way to allocate your resources or discretionary efforts required to achieve your goal. If you have any more than seven priorities, you are likely to overwhelm yourself and your team with all the things that need to be focused on. This is important to consider when establishing your team in Microsoft Teams. As described in part one, when you set up your team, you can create a channel. You might like to think of a channel as an equivalent of a, to a folder that you might create in Outlook or File Explorer. Instead of being a place where you can keep emails about a similar topic or files relating to a specific area, a channel is a way to group together both your conversations and files and other things like tabs that bring, to, bring in third-party applications in one spot. At the time of writing, and I'm pretty sure this is still the case now, I haven't checked it for a while, but I'm pretty sure it's all the same, um, you can create up to 250 channels in your team. And we've seen many people try to hit that limit unintentionally by creating a channel for every possible permutation of what their team does or thinks about. When you probe the owners of these teams to understand more about how they work, excuse me, excuse me, in the workspace, we see responses from both ends of the spectrum. Either only a few of the channels see any regular engagement and the rest language with messages that have no replies or worse still, there is no activity at all. Or most of the channels are actively engaged in, but not all channels relate to all members of the team. This leads to distraction, unnecessary notifications and more overwhelm. So how can you set up your team for success? First, think of three to seven priorities that you and your peers using the team need to focus on. If you think of more than seven, we suggest it's probably worthwhile breaking your priorities into two different teams and doing the exercise again. Those priorities should align nicely with the channels that you set up in your team. Think of one or two words that sum up your priority. Priority. Those words can become the name of the channel in which you focus your effort towards that priority. Make sure the channel name is clear so everyone who joins the team understands exactly what uh, that channel is for and knows where to group together your conversations, files, and meetings about specific topics. Let's talk about adding some structural flair to your channels. One of the first things you'll notice when you start to add channels to your team is that they appear in alphabetical order. Well, that might work in some scenarios. In others where some may be more of a priority than others, you will want to have control over the order in which the channels appear. The general channel will always be first. Um, but before you say, I wish we could delete or rename the general channel, which we hear quite often, um, we think it's great that it stays there. As you will read about in the next chapter, um, uh, the, sorry, this uh, yeah, the next chapter um, after this one, which we'll do in the next live stream uh, called Principles, the general channel has a role to play in creating a space where you can talk about how you work together as a team. And you think of it as like a meta channel where you can talk about you know, the rules of engagement, how you want to engage with each other, supporting each other in the practice of collaboration. Um, don't just have it as a general chat channel or something like that. After the general channel, how do we order our higher priorities a bit higher in the order of the channels? As Microsoft Teams uses alphanumeric order, you can use that to your advantage. Use a simple numbering system as a prefix to your channels. Place a one in front of your top priority, a two in front of your second priority, and so on. This approach is very handy for your channels, so if your channel is mapped to a customer or stakeholder journey. 
for the channel that maps to the first step of the journey, start the channel name with one, number one. The second step, uh, the second step, start it with number two. You don't need to number every channel, just the ones you want to appear in order at the top of your list. Another way you can focus or bring attention to your channel is by adding an emoji to it. You may not be aware, but there is a virtual emoji keyboard built into Windows 10. You can open it right now if you want to, simply by holding down the Windows key and pressing the full stop button. Give it a try. You'll now have access to a library of different emojis or emoticons that you can add to your next Word document, presentation, or the name of your Microsoft Teams channel. Here are a few examples that we put in the book. Um, and thankfully, the printer could actually print them for us, which is good. Um, we're not suggesting that you use emojis all the time. Uh, when it makes sense, there is an emoji that relates to the focus of the channel. It's a great way to bring attention to it. You might notice some of the screen. So you might notice some of the screenshots we have included in the book of the team we used to uh, we set up to write this book. Uh, there are four channels which are high priority for us in, in which we have included an emoji at the start of the channel name. If I kind of bring that up to the camera, you know, it's one of the last screenshots. Kind of get focus on it. You might be able to see them um, there. See the channels there with the different emojis in front of it. Uh, probably not the best resolution on the book, um, printed in black and white as well. But we had four channels there, working manuscript, coaching review, screenshots, and research. We just had an emoji that related to those different things we had there. So the working manuscript was a pen, obviously, because that's how we were writing the book, as an example. Um, the other neat feature of using an emoji at the start of the channel name is that emojis are higher in the alphanumeric order that Microsoft Teams uses. So they will appear at the top of your channel list, just below the general channel. So one quick thing about prioritizing your channels and having like some numeric order to those to get them in the right order. Um, there are some scenarios where you might have more than seven channels or eight channels, right? And the classic example of that would be if you had a, a customer journey where it was more steps than seven or eight. Uh, you might have a project management methodology that might have you know nine or 10 or 12 gates that you go through throughout the life cycle of the project. You might have a channel for each one of those stages of that particular project. Um, in that case there, if you're ever going to get to a point where you have more than nine channels that you'd want to order, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, what we recommend from the start is make sure you use two digits for that number at the start. So 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, 0, 04, et cetera. And the reason why is if you get to uh, channel 10 or channel 11, uh, in the ordering of the alphanumeric, you'd have channel 1, channel 10, channel 11, then channel 2. So I guess if you're going to have more than 10, just make sure you have like two digits for the number at the start of the, as a prefix for the channel name, not one. And that'll help you overcome that challenge. Um, but generally, don't try to have that many channels in the first place. All right, so what about private channels? Private channels give you the ability to lock down, excuse me, I ate my lunch way too quickly today, my apologies. Private channels give you the ability to lock down or restrict access to conversations and files for a subset of the people in your team. It was the most requested feature to be added to Microsoft Teams via user voice and was rolled out worldwide in late 2019. And interestingly, it was something that was rolled out um, as we published the book. So we actually had to write this about three months before we knew it got rolled out public, the joy of publishing you know, traditional media. As we described in the previous chapter, a simple rule of thumb for most use cases is that if you think you need more than one private channel in a team, you are better off creating a separate team for that group of individuals to collaborate and coordinate in. The reason we say this, apart from providing a little bit of control on, excuse me, oh my goodness, I'm going to mute for a second. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, the reason we say this, apart from providing a little bit of control on what uh, could be a land rush of private channels as people discover the feature, has to do with the data security of your work. And we kind of talked about this a little bit in the last chapter. If you are structuring your team well, following the 10 Ps, you'll be very clear from the name of the team what the purpose of the space is and, the like and likely the membership of the space as well. Participants in the team will have a mental model through which they can quickly understand who has access to what information. The members will be confident that the messages, documents, spreadsheets, presentations, meetings, and other items shared will be seen by a known group of people. As you start to introduce private channels, that mental model will start to deteriorate. With one private channel, you're a member of that channel, and you'll be, uh, we will be able to maintain that mental model in your head. I know that there are 14 people who are a member of this, member of this team, and there are only four of us in the private channel. As more private channels are introduced, this will start to get complicated very quickly especially if the membership of each private channel is different. The risk of overwhelm caused by private channels is that you or your peers post conversations or files into channels where you're not 100% sure of the membership 
and potentially unintentionally expose information. They lose the confidence of knowing who has access to what, reducing trust in the system that you have put together. Oh my goodness, they, they, it was an amazing chicken schnitzel sandwich that I had. I'm sure you don't want to hear all the details about it, but um, oh my way, should, should do, not do the live streams after lunch uh, again. I think doing them in the morning might be better. All right, um, so what are the key takeaways from that priorities chapter? Let's have a quick chat about them. Um, so first of all, avoid adding channel, avoid just adding channels to your team. Stop and think about your priorities as a group. Again, it's probably something you can do at the start when you create the team, but you don't have to necessarily decide what your priorities are from the outset. But just remember, if you're adding more channels to your team down the track, make sure they align to the priorities of what you're trying to achieve as a team. Don't just do random channels for the sake of it. Aim for three to seven priorities and therefore channels for your team. If you have more than seven priorities, think about splitting the team into two or more teams, as chances are not everything on your list is a priority for everyone. And like using the project example I gave earlier, you might have a 12-step project management process. As long as all those 12 steps are relevant to everyone who's a member of the team, like that's an okay exception to that rule. If the first five steps of that were around um, you know, deciding if you're going to invest in the project or not in the first place, and the, only really a subset of that team was involved in that process and steps you know, six through 12 were actually delivering the project, that might make sense to split that into two different teams, one for the investment decision in the project, the other one for actually delivering the project um, as well. Um, if you use numbers or emojis as prefixes, you can structure the order in which your channels appear. Um, well, I think I just uh, missed one of them as well. If you have any more, so if you have any more than seven priorities, think about splitting the team into two or more teams. As chances are not everything. I did say that one before. My apologies. Um, don't overuse or abuse private channels. Chances are, if you have more than one private channel, you would be better off setting up a separate team for that group of people. And our end of chapter checklist, end of chapter checklist for this one. Um, not everything is a priority for everyone. If you have more than seven priorities on your list, consider splitting into two or more teams. This will enable your people to better filter their attention throughout their work days. Make sure that the channel names you use to represent those priorities are short and clear. Use numbers or emojis to ensure that channels appear at the top of your list and fill in uh, the step in your 10 P's workbook. All right, so that's two chapters for the day. I think we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there because uh, I don't want to, don't want you to, have to sit through my lunch repeating on myself all day. Um, for those of you who don't want to hear burps or coughs or uh, lip smacks or anything like that, um, the audible version of this is a far better quality uh, if, you, if you don't want to be distracted by those things. Uh, we recorded it over three days and every single time I had a tummy rumble or a cough or anything like that, the, uh, the producer would hold us up and have to reline, redo that line every single time. So that was one of the most frustrating parts of my life, trying to narrate an audio book um, over those three days. But and we got a far better outcome in terms of quality than what you get here. But, um, but with that, thank you so much for joining uh, the call today, the live stream today. Appreciate those that joined us live uh, and those that have come in afterwards to, to uh, see the, um, the replay as well. Um, if you have any questions, again, please feel free to throw them into the comments. We'll get in there fairly regularly and respond to the comments that you put in there. Um, if you have any specific questions around your team structures or how you design your team, or you've got an example of a team you're thinking about designing and you want to just quickly validate it with us, feel free to throw that in the comments as well and we can give you some feedback on that too. Um, but with that, I hope you have the great rest of your day and we'll see you next Thursday probably. Um, hopefully in the morning without all the gurgling uh, for the next two chapters of the book um, where we go into principles and we'll think about how do we agree on how we're going to use the space and, and how um, and how we're going to um, you know work together in the space to get the outcome that we want to achieve and we're going to talk about plugins so how do we bring third-party capability into the team through tabs connectors bots and other bits and pieces like that so getting into more of the meaty bits of how we use the space now we've created it in the next uh, next live stream so uh, until we till then I uh, hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time. Cheers.